Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Demerjan, and I'm going to uh, present uh, the work that we have developed uh, during our master's studies. Our main goal in uh, establishing this work was uh, reducing uh, the design gap between physical models, processes, uh, especially digital processes, and uh, spatial data. Um, and while doing this, uh, we have followed a twofold approach where uh, our first uh, aim was uh, to create algorithms uh, and generative systems uh, that are quite abstract in nature, nature uh, to allow for more freedom and speed through, our, through the design process. And the other part uh, of the system is like preserving a very explicit uh, connection uh, between our uh, generative systems and the spatial data. And for the trials, um, we have used uh, data for wind velocity, uh, which was uh, divided into uh, two dimensions of speed and direction. Um, and since our uh, focus was on uh, generating design uh, and generating not a single design, but a design method. Uh, we uh, created our own data. It's quite arbitrary. We just uh, created uh, imaginary stations for uh, wind values, and we started from there. So uh, for the trials, we have used wind data, but in the end, it could be data from anything. It could uh, probably be uh, results of spatial uh, analysis as well. And so our imaginary stations uh, were placed on a grid. And uh, to work with, uh, we needed raster data. So we needed uh, data for every point in between the stations. And for that, we used the uh, simplest form that we could find. We went for inverse distance inter weighting interpolation by Donald Shepard. It's uh, quite an old system. And uh, since it was very simple, uh, we preferred it. And uh, using IDW, um, we came up with uh, raster maps uh, for wind speeds. Uh, and this is the uh, linear map that we used uh, finally in Maya. And this is a more uh, human legible version of it. And this is our uh, raster data uh, for wind direction uh, from 0 to 360. And this is the legible version. And after uh, generating the data, uh, we carried it uh, into Maya, which is an animation software. And it was preferred uh, throughout uh, the whole system. And in Maya, we used XGen, uh, which is a uh, plugin for Maya that is normally used to create hair and animate hair in movies. But uh, we kind of uh, repurposed it with minor tweaks. And uh, we used uh, some male expressions to connect uh, the orient orientation of uh, placeholders to the raster data. And then we uh, connected their affine scale in the local z-axis uh, to the wind speed data uh, to set up our basic system. And then we uh, replaced the placeholders with uh, generated models uh, that have shape changing rules based on the data. And uh, then uh, we have interpolated. Uh, these are the different uh, specimens that we have tried. And the uh, main limitation here is that the geometric topology has to be uh, solid uh, and it shouldn't change. But uh, we can morph the uh, points uh, however we like. And this was uh, quite an intuitive uh, approach. And then uh, we have interpolated uh, between the rules. And so uh, we have created uh, keyframe animations. And this allowed us to uh, create uh, new shapes for every any point that we want uh, between the starting and the ending positions. And then we have uh, connected them to our existing system. And this has created a situation where uh, the keyframe of each object was connected to wind speed, and their alignment was uh, connected to the wind direction. And then 
uh, we have uh, generated an arbitrary uh, elevation model. This is uh, completely made up, but uh, we have used it to uh, try if this system uh, can generate form on uh, these conditions. And this is the rendering of the situation. And it only began uh, interesting when we started playing with the pivot positions of the uh, original geometry. When we changed the pivot uh, position and orientation, uh, it started to uh, become more visible. Uh, the main uh, shape was uh, emergent and it certainly did show uh, characteristics of the underlying data and the designer uh, could play with parameters to shape it uh, to, some to, to a certain degree. And this is another rendering of the situation. And uh, what amazed us uh, at this point was uh, that there is not a single parameter here uh, that is random. It's completely taken from the underlying data and parameters are explicit. And then we went on to uh, our second trial. And here uh, we have uh, moved on from uh, a morphing approach to an uh, IK, inverse kinematics. Um, and inverse kinematics is used commonly in animation and visual effects. Uh, it's actually based on the creation of uh, conceptual skeletons. And we can uh, replace parts of the skeletons with uh, any geometry that we like. And we can animate the endpoint of the skeleton and uh, the system can interpolate uh, all the in-between parts. And we have combined this uh, with long exposure photography, uh, the concept of long ex exposure, where uh, we can create form from the motion of the inverse kinematic system. And I'd like to uh, quote Bernard Schumi here. Uh, he actually describes something similar uh, for uh, the logic of choreographic movements. Uh, Notation ultimately suggests real corridors of space as if the dancer has been carving space out of a pliable surface or the reverse, shaping continuous uh, volumes as if movement has literally been solidified. And this approach uh, was used before um, by artists and uh, mainly in uh, uh, context of art, but uh, we didn't want uh, the designer to like uh, shape the thing. Uh, we want data to shape the whole thing, uh, but I'll come to that later. But these are our initial models uh, based on the wing motion of birds. Uh, so uh, here uh, we can use these uh, inverse kinematics uh, to create form. And the input here is very simple. We, we just need to animate the endpoint and when we, uh, have the system work on it, we can generate uh, extremely complex forms. And this is another example of it. So <coughs> we can like move the whole uh, shape uh, on a curve and then we can animate the endpoint uh, to come up with different shapes. And these are our first results and um, in this case, uh, it's it's not very uh, it's not uh, what we uh, ultimately want to be uh, because we wanted, uh, as I've said before, data to shape the design, not like animate uh, in an ambiguous way. And so, in this case, we also wanted uh, additional data. We wanted uh, these shapes to uh, be formed on a terrain, and that's why. Uh, and we wanted to work very fast. Uh, we didn't uh, survey real terrain, so uh, we went on to create uh, conceptual surfaces uh, by different materials, including uh, plaster and fabric. Uh, we just wanted the uh, surfaces to have some uh, inner uh, structure, uh, but we wanted to work fast and free. Uh, so we uh, came up came up with uh, a few models uh, to have our algorithms work on. And this is the main one. And we, we have used cloth and some rocks underneath the cloth. And after uh, attaining tension on the cloth, uh, we covered it in stretch film. And then we uh, 
poured uh, plaster and bandages on the form. And it was something like this, some kind of uh, testing landscape. And then we used photogrammetry. We shot it from different angles and uh, it was an off the shelf approach. So that was very fast as well. So we took the photos into uh, photo scan software and we came up with a digital landscape where we could test our algorithms further. And when we carried it into Maya, it was like much, uh, it had a um, nature which is much richer than our initial uh, digital elevation model, which was just interpolated random points. Um, this has some uh, implicit properties of the physical material. And this topography alone uh, has uh, allowed, uh, supplied us with uh, a good amount of data. And then uh, our initial test was to just project curves on this and uh, have our system run on the curves and this uh, generated forms like this. But in this case, the animation is not connected to anything. It's connecting to basically time. So they run the animation uh, in a normal way and then they change their position on the U coordinates of the curve and uh, generate this form. But coming back again, we want the data to shape it, not curves or uh, user-based uh, input, alone at least. Uh, so in our third trial, uh, we went on uh, to try BOITS, uh, which is uh, some type of uh, swarm intelligence uh, put together by Craig Reynolds. And this uh, algorithm was initially created for uh, animating schools of fish and birds. And so it's uh, by nature very simple. There are only three rules and we can change these rules and the results uh, create uh, complex situations. And I will quote Greg Lynn here. Um, he uses uh, in his book, Animate Form, uh, the metaphor of a Frisbee, a dog and a landscape uh, where the dog has to, if, if the dog wants to catch the Frisbee, uh, he can't run a linear function, he has to follow the frisbee and change his heading accordingly. And we really uh, like this approach and uh, I'll, I'll borrow his terms. Um, we aim for the designer to throw a frisbee and uh, the data to shape its trajectory. trajectory. And uh, we didn't want to use a single dog because uh, in AI it's very difficult to create a uh, dog with intelligence. So we use the swarm actually uh, to solve the situation. And this is uh, one of the results. So uh, here there is uh, embedded wind data, uh, the topography data of our physical model and the long exposure uh, of our system running on it. And these are some videos uh, showing the process. So uh, I'll show three variations. Um, the good thing is, um, there are, uh, we can change the three parameters of the Boyd system and uh, the user can animate them or these parameters can be connected to underlying data as well. And this is another situation with different parameters. And uh, what, is, uh, what uh, excited us here was like, uh, the agents are not very intelligent. They are like almost randomly trying to navigate the terrain, but uh, one of the rules uh, forces them to go for the uh, average uh, center of the whole swarm. And for that reason, if one member of the swarm finds a solution, uh, the center is drastically moved. So the rest of the swarm uh, tries to follow and uh, that allows them to navigate the uh, terrain uh, in a more intelligent way uh, than each member. And this is uh, how we sampled the data. And for, uh, for the system to work faster, uh, we didn't uh, sample uh, each agent, but uh, we took a sample from their uh, average uh, position center. And uh, we used the data uh, to run the keyframe animation. So the animation is not connected to time, uh, but it's uh, connected to wind speed data. And in the direction actually, uh, changes their traje trajectory. And these are uh, another sets of results. And 
in the system uh, by changing different parameters uh, creates a huge amount of shapes uh, that we can uh, use for the design process. And then we wanted, um, if I go back to the beginning, uh, we wanted this uh, system to work on physical models as well because um, we value the physical uh, modeling part of design. And for this we used uh, video mapping and since uh, our photography was quite accurate, uh, we could reproject the results uh, onto the physical model. And this is a video showing the results. So uh, the user can see the results on the surface, albeit a little flat, uh, but it's possible here to like see the results, uh, make additional changes and run the algorithm uh, recursively. Uh, and at this point, um, we, in the future, we want the, uh, instead of video mapping, because it's kind of limiting, limited, uh, even documenting uh, is a little problematic, like uh, we took uh, like many uh, video shots uh, of the mapping process, but uh, it never uh, creates the same effect uh, that is in the actual studio. Uh, so for future work, we instead want this uh, system to drive additional or subtractive manufacturing processes uh, to like both document uh, the process better and uh, to work more intuitively on it. Um, that's all on the study. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So now we will have um, Rudy Stuffs and Osba Sefer from, East, uh, from Singapore Natural uh, University and Istanbul Technology University. The speaker will be Rudy Stuffs. He will talk us about shapes and attributes. If you please. Thank you. This is a um, much more theoretical. <laughs> presentation than I held this uh, morning. It relates to um, shape grammars, and it's um, really trying to find a way to, um, for people to adapt shape grammars to their own um, needs and requirements. So for those people, for those of you who may not know exactly what shape grammars are, this is a very typical a uh, simple example of a shape grammar. There are three, there are two rules actually only. Uh, one takes a square and moves the square diagonally. The other one takes an L-shaped and uh, moves it also um, diagonally. Uh, and then it, there's an initial shape, which is shown in the middle, which is the two L-shapes um, touching each other. And then you can, uh, starting from that initial shape, you can have a derivation. So um, for example, you, well, of course, the first, at first you can only apply rule two because you only have L-shaped, L-shapes. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you move, they will overlap. As a result, they will create um, five um, squares. So you could take any square, um, apply rule one. In this case, the center one is taken. It is moved uh, diagonally. As a result, an, an, another L-shape is created. So we can try rule two again, move the L shape, uh, move it once more, new squares are formed, um, et cetera. So this is uh, a typical example, except that it is um, rather, um, well, it is simple in the sense that it actually only uses um, geometry. There are only lines in this. Um, in general, um, shape grammars often have other information included, let's say, uh, labeled points, so for example, to guide the rule application process. And um, there's other examples as well. Here are a few um, from the literature. So um, George Steiny's introduction to shape and shape grammars relies on line segments and uh, labeled points. Um, later on, he has a paper in which he introduces uh, numeric weights to um, uh, to define line thicknesses or surface tones if we're, uh, if we're working in, uh, with surfaces. Um, Terry Knight um, 
introduces uh, other qualitative aspects of design. Uh, for example, color, I'll get back to that. And uh, Stein himself also uh, introduces the notion of descriptions as um, verbal descriptions of um, aspects of design. And these, of course, are only the, like the most, uh, I, I would say, well, most important, but I mean, the, the, the most well-known examples. Um, there are many other uh, examples of people who um, create shape crammers and decide that they need uh, some information that they can't express in this and um, so expand it with uh, additional types of information. But in order to make the problem um, understandable, I'm going to use this um, case study. It's, uh, it's, an, it's a different shape grammar, this time um, by Steine. It has three rules. And basically, the idea is to take a, a square and inscribe a smaller square rotated that touches it. So there are three, the first rule actually just takes an initial um, marker, a point, and creates a square. The square is uh, marked also with a point in order to reduce the, um, the um, rotational uh, symmetry. Then there's a second, uh, there's rule two in, is the one rule that takes, that inscribes a, a rotated square in it, which can be applied on the original square and then recursively on the smaller square that is um, most recently defined. And then the last rule is just to take away the marker because the marker is something that isn't part of the design, it's only part of the um, process. Now, if we take this example and instead we, um, rather than just having um, inscribed squares, we want to color these squares alternatively with white and black, then there are already a few different ways to approach this. And um, the first approach I want to show is inspired by um, Terry Knight's work on, on, on color grammars. So it uses enumerative colors as um, attributes. So it basically enumerates two colors. They're called uh, black and white. And they adopt an opaque ranking. Um, so ranking is, is the notion that she uses to um, deal with these enumerative colors. Opaque just means that whatever color you apply to it will overwrite whatever color is underneath it. Because it's opaque, you can't um, see through it. Now, in order to match, um, so in order to have the rule match, you need to have the same um, enumerative values or the same color um, as is um, there originally. And as such, we have two alternative versions of the um, second rule. One is a, a rule that inscribes a white square in a black one, and the other one inscribes a black square in a white one, obviously, um, because you know, we need to decide which color um, to inscribe. For the rest, the derivation is um, quite the same. And so this is one way of um, getting this alternative infield to work. But in fact, we can use a, a different way. For example, we could use weights, as um, Steine um, suggested. Um, now, weights are numerical values. So they can go from, um, for example, 0 to 1. And um, in this case, we could assign 0 to be white and 1 to be black. I mean, if you prefer. Um, the other way around, it could, could also be, it depends whether you're considering the background to be white or the background to be black, of course. Um, and the, the, the rule here is that with, with numerical values, uh, matching requires a, a, either an equal or a higher value. So if you want to, uh, if you're looking for a black square, black being one, then it has to be black because it has to be at least one. But if you're looking for a white square with a value of zero, then actually any square that would have a value between zero and one would apply. And as a result of that, we not only need one extra rule, but we also have to uh, um, distinguish the markers between um, white and black 
and we assign the color to the marker the opposite of the color we assign to the square. So that um, even though if you're looking for a white square, a black square could do because the markers have the opposite um, color, then the matching wouldn't occur anymore. And so the only thing as a result, because of the markers having different colors, we um, at the end also have to have two rules for termination, one that removes a white marker and one removes a black marker. So the conclusion from this is that it's important to know, it's not just about, well, we're using black and white and so we can alternate and that's it. If you really want to implement a shape grammar, you would have to know how you want to treat these colors. Do you want to treat them as weights? Do you want to treat them as enumerative values? Maybe you want to treat them as an, in another way. And that's really what um, this research is about. So what, I would, what, um, what I've done is look at how you can generalize this. So even though there are multiple ways of looking at color, how can we generalize, how can we get a uniform um, description for a behavior of um, colors, even if the colors are, uh, can be treated differently. So this is, um, I mean, the outcome, let's, you know, I'll simplify it um, a little bit. So basically, um, we've got um, two values. In this particular case, we just have two colors, and they have, um, they're defined by um, enumerative value of C and C prime. And so they are um, singletons because every two colors automatically combine, so there's always only one value. And all we're interested in is what is the behavior under sum, what's the behavior under difference, and what's the behavior under uh, product, and um, how do they compare. And so those four um, is really the, um, let's say, the, the formal approach to defining this behavior for colors. And so in this particular case with enumerative values, um, you could draw this little um, table here. Um, at the top you have, um, well, let's say on the left-hand side you have the existing color, X, which can be black or white. And at the top you have the new color that is being added, uh, Y, which can also be black or white. And since we're using an opaque ranking in this particular example, the new color overrides the old one. And so in our table, black and black gives black, um, black and white gives white, and um, et cetera. And we can represent this uh, mathematically using this um, XY table um, with um, a row and column C and C prime. So, so our, our um, values are the um, indices into the table, and so when we're adding two colors together, um, all we have to look is what is the value um, according to the row and column in the table, and that is the result of addition. For subtraction, um, we've said that, and for um, intersection, we've said that, well, it only applies if the color is the same, so of course if you subtract the same color, you will get nothing, and otherwise you'll get to the original color, and the opposite for um, intersection. If they're the same, then you keep the color um, or product, and if they're different, then you won't have nothing because there's nothing in, um, in common. Then we can do the same thing for um, weights. So as I said, you know, we have a numerical values, and we're looking at um, everything. It has to be at least the same. So the behavior basically is that when you want to add two weights, um, you take the maximum, if you want to t take the, the product, you take the minimum, and um, Steine says that, well, when you take the difference, you should really take the arithmetic difference of the two uh, values, and that's what is um, expressed there. But is that so? I mean, it's a way of in interpretation. Um, a while back, I actually, I didn't, you know, I hadn't read uh, Stein is quite well, and I thought that, well, if adding two um, weights, if adding a smaller weight than, a, than the weight you already have doesn't do anything, then why should subtracting a smaller weight have a, have a result? 
And that's what's shown here at the bottom. So if you add all the way on the left hand side, if you subtract the bigger, um, uh, well in this case uh, the weights are expressed as line thicknesses, so if you ex um, subtract a line with a, uh, um, a thicker thickness from a smaller thickness, then you will get nothing. Um, but if it's, you subtract a smaller thickness, in um, Steiny's case you would take the arithmetic difference and in this variant um, nothing would happen um, because it's a different interpretation. Maybe it has a, a particular meaning uh, for somebody. Now what's the result of that? That is um, interesting to see. So in Steiny's case, if you would uh, have a certain thickness and you would subtract an infin infinitesimally small um, distance and you subtract it and you add it and you subtract it and you add it, because the adding never does anything because it's so small, um, the subtracting eventually makes your line thickness empty and so you um, alternate between the smallest uh, thickness and nothing and it goes on like that. And in, um, in this case, if you subtract an infinitesimally small uh, thickness, nothing happens. It always, and you add it again, no, uh, nothing happens. And it's really about, so how could you explain it? Well, if you subtract something infin infinitesimally small, it's kind of like subtracting zero. Um, so in this case, you're saying, well, it's, it's really zero, so nothing happens. In the other case, it's like you're subtracting something so small, and then after a while, there's nothing uh, left. It's um, even though, so the, the original thickness doesn't play a role. And as I said, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to say that one is better than the other. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. It's really about, you know, maybe in some situations, one may, may, may be more appropriate than in the other. Um, and then I looked on and I said, well, you know, colors, of course, um, if we go beyond black and white, we might um, want an RGB space or maybe we want an HSV space. Um, but for the rest, we could do something similar to weights. So if we add two colors, we just take the maximum of the respective um, RG and B values. And um, if we subtract, we could use um, um, mathematical subtraction and the minimum, and, and the product is the minimum. And so this is one way of looking at it. And maybe a different way of looking at this is well, what if we take colors as um, paints and we kind of acknowledge the fact that if you take a darker color and a lighter color and you mix them, you get something in between. So maybe we should just take the average. And so this is an alternative rep uh, uh, behavior for colors where um, some is just taking the average and then why not? Subtracting might just also be, um, because it's kind of similar to uh, adding, so it's also, um, average and then for minimum we'll just uh, for product we'll just uh, keep it at the minimum and well maybe we want to um, consider colors as a four-dimensional space with um, transparency with an alpha value and as you're aware um, well as you may be aware for um, uh, transparency values if you're working with a foreground and a background and your foreground has a transparency value then um, the background, of course, comes through as one minus that transparency value. But rather than trying to understand foreground and background, um, basically the idea was whatever the background, what if we have two foreground colors, each with their own transparency, how would we combine them? And um, well, it doesn't quite contain the result here. Um, I said, well, there's some function called over um, xy, and this is really behavior of over. So if the um, transparency of the first color is zero, so it is um, fully transparent, or the second color is fully opaque, then obviously it's the second color uh, completely. On the other hand, if the second color is fully transparent, then of course it's just the first color. And if the um, first color is fully opaque, um, but the second one is transparent, then of course the transparency of the first one doesn't play a role and so it simplifies it a little bit and otherwise you've got the whole, the entire formula of trying to define what are the um, values and the um, transparency values. 
And um, so once we've done this and we now understand how we can describe in many different ways what the um, sum product and differences of two um, attribute values, then we can actually say, okay, now if we have some geometry, and I just simplify it here with points, and they have some attribute, and the attribute, the behavior of the attribute is really not that important, except that we know how some product and difference are described, then um, we can come up with this kind of um, uh, formula. And uh, just to um, try to um, explain it a little bit, so if we have two sets of um, two shapes or two sets of points, uh, P and uh, P prime, with two um, sets of attributes, A and A prime, then, um, well, basically we have to distinguish between um, the, uh, the, sh the, the, sh the points in P that are not in P prime, the points in P prime that are not in P, and then the intersection of it. And each of them, for of course, P minus P prime, since there's no commonality with P prime, then of course the attribute will just be A, and et cetera, and then otherwise the attribute is defined as the uh, sum, the difference, or um, the product. And then these M and E's are just kind of like, have to do with the fact that, well, you never want to have a point without an attribute. Um, well, sometimes you don't want that. And so um, if uh, P is, n is zero, then the whole thing should be zero rather than having uh, an attribute. And um, M is about the fact that we don't know, it's kind of hard to explain how this thing happens when you have multiple points and multiple um, uh, points. And so we just say, well, we've got one set of points and then we keep on adding one at a time and that's easy to describe. But um, you know, if you want to, the details of it, you can uh, find it in the paper. So really what this um, whole <laughs> presentation is about is that there's no right behavioral specification. Um, if you, this is just about colors, but if, I mean, we can think about a lot of other um, attributes that could be relevant. And there's really, um, you know, everybody could come up with their own uh, specification based on the uh, context you're working within, what you uh, want to achieve, et cetera. And I think this should be supported. And so in order to support that, just not, not just theoretically, um, the work here is basically um, feeding into a modular implementation of a shape grammar interpreter. So because it's modular, you can actually add new behaviors as little plugins, as little modules that you just throw in there, and then the shape grammar interpreter can deal with this. So it's, a, it's like um, you try to use a shape grammar interpreter, and, but it only allows for A and B and C, but you want D, um, then it would be complicated. You would have to um, redevelop it. So by using this kind of uniform um, characterization um, allows you firstly to um, specify explicitly how this information should be um, dealt with, and secondly, being able to translate it into a, um, into a module that could be um, added to a shape grammar interpreter. And so if anybody is um, interested in that part, which is the more practical part, um, you can always visit um, www.sortful.org where um, the uh, shape grammar interpreter is um, available and I'd you know, always be happy to uh, work with people to expand its, uh, you know, its possibilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, now we will have Ricardo Massena Gago from Lisbon University. Uh, he's going to speak to us about generative biomorphism. Yep. So the title of my research is uh, is generative generative biomorphism. He's a he's a research in the in the bio-inspired design field. Uh, we deals with the generation of humans of human structures. So as I mentioned, uh, this this uh, generative biomorphism is a research in the bio-inspired design field. More precisely, 
we deal with the generation of human of human structures uh, by following the uh, by following the design requirements that characterize the morphological identity of the biological structures. Despite uh, the shape the shape and diversity biological structures um, achieve their ecological performance by by morphological coherence. It happens because uh, they exist in profit to a common whole. So it reveals that the ecological purpose follows a common geometrical pattern in order to allow uh, the interaction and the cooperation between structures. Most of the solutions and most of the solutions developed by the human design uh, strategies uh, do not reflect these, these uh, qualities. So this research aims to, to increase the morphological currents between biological and, and human structures by following the, the, generative design, the generative design process that characterize the biological structures. So um, biological structures are, are perfectly uh, uh, recognizable in the, in the environment regardless of their shapes. They inform us that they have this quality. So it means that the phenomenon of life imposes a kind of uh, signature in, in, in their structures and, and identity. So according to Celso, Vieira, the, 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 the identity um, lies in the process. The object only shows the, um, the signature. So, so the, the identity, um, so, so the identity resides in the, in the geometrical pattern of the shapes, but the geometry by itself is not enough to generate identity. It requires a, uh, an organizational pattern uh, flexible to change in order in order to allow the um, the shape diversity uh, so so in geometrical terms uh, the the implementation of the um, of the biological identity in human structures demands at least three geometrical uh, requirements uh, a generative design process a growth mechanisms and um, a geometrical pattern so why, be, uh, why bio-inspired structures should follow a generative design process? Because biological uh, structures uh, change without compromising their, their morphological identity. It means that, um, that this quality is, is a static quality. Uh, what generates uh, shape, uh, shape diversity is how the geometrical, uh, the geometrical vocabulary is, is uh, sequenced. Uh, what is the role of growth um, in, in, the, in the generation process? At the geometrical level, uh, it imposes a, a, a structural organization. Growth expands uh, uh, through a centroidal configuration, uh, which is characterized by, by levels and sublevels of, of expansion that uh, follows um, a gradient pattern and, and which generates um, a force field that highlights the, the composition centers. About the biological geometry, um, uh, biological geometry emerged from a, 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 from a reproduction process of elements addition that follows a um, particular configuration. Both follows a uh, geometrical and, uh, and uh, proportional requirements sorry so so the elements uh, require as geometrical um, as geometrical qualities shapes of triangular derivation that 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 reveal local symmetries and their their arrangement in sp in space should follow uh, or, sh or should be made by simple aggregation and should be organized uh, through a uh, expansion pattern. As regards the, um, the, the, the proportional requirements, the order of magnitude of the elements and shapes should follow the, the harmonious values of the golden ratio. 
So to, uh, to implement this uh, geometrical pattern in human structures, it, it, uh, it requires a generative design process able to, to, to decode uh, these geometrical qualities into rules. Uh, so for that purpose, I use the shape grammars. So the shape generation process um, is composed by a main grammar uh, that will define the, the structural base of the shape and the supplementary and supplementary grammars that will enrich the the uh, the first uh, uh, structural base with uh, with uh, uh, with textures and rudeness and three dimensional configurations so as i mentioned before the main grammar will define the the structural base its its definition requires to all or its definition, it's, it's divided in, in two phases. In the first phase, uh, I use the, the Eiden rules and uh, they will define the, um, um, the expression pattern of this shape. Its definition <coughs> requires angle, its, its definition requires levels and some levels of expression that will control the the the, propor the the proportional relations between shapes and um, and the elements over the um, over the expression levels uh, uh, a, re a referential shape is um, is defined its definition r requires um, an expression angle and the, the boundaries of this shape should follow a uh, concave and convex pattern. Uh, the number of the of the expression uh, of the expression levels and the, and the amplitude of the expression angle uh, will influence the, the the shape diversity. In the second phase, uh, the the materialization rules will define the the structural shape um, the structural elements of the shapes. Uh, these elements will, will be defined by using the, the geometrical principles of the, of, of the Voronoi diagrams for, centra for centroidal configuration. Uh, the, supplementary, uh, the supplementary grammars are composed by three distinct grammars. The special grammar is one of them. The special rules will transfer the, the, the geometrical mesh uh, <laughs> defined by the main grammar for a curved, surpa for a curved surface in space. Um, the choice of this curved surface cannot be random. They should follow uh, a central wall configuration and should, and should r r reveal concave and convex patterns. Uh, for that pur with this geometrical qualities, uh, three geometrical uh, surfaces are used. Uh, they are the cone, the, the sphere, and the torus. Uh, the rudeness with, uh, with, the, uh, with the rudeness grammar, uh, um, the rules of this grammar um, aims to increase the, the, uh, the morphological vibration and, and dynamism of the shape by adding um, at the at the boundaries of the structure elements uh, some some irregularity. Uh, this 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 irregularity can be implemented uh, by two by three distinct uh, ways by nodes displacement by curved nodes and curved boundaries, and finally the texture rules. Uh, uh, will explore the the shape appearance. The geometrical the geometrical mesh will work as a as a uh, as a referential base for their definition. Um, their definition is over is made over the 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 structural elements and should follow two distant uh, two distant geometrical patterns. Uh, 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 ramification pattern and uh, compact pattern. Uh, their, their definition should also follow a geometrical, a geometrical pattern based on, um, on alternated 
repetition that should be characterized by 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 construct uh, by by contrast strategies. The 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 implementation of these patterns uh, should be made at the uh, two-dimensional level, and when when they are transferred for a curved surface, they should should uh, reveal a two-dimensional configuration that can be obtained by by extrusion. In this slide, I have uh, one example of a shape that uh, that has been generated with the ramification pattern. In this other one, it's a it's a uh, work that I did for um, uh, for a land art competition, and I use also the same ramification pattern. In this uh, example, I use the same geometrical mesh, uh, but using the compact pattern, and and I and I developed two distant uh, geometries. Uh, is one by cell extrusion, and the other by cell aggregation. This other one is another is another shape that I generate with the um, with, with the compact pattern and by cells extrusion. And by and by and about the the the, the, the conclusion. Sorry, the uh, the drawing tool is is able to implement the geometrical qualities simultaneously in the structures. Uh, it is able to generate shape and diversity without compromising the morphological identity. And the structural organization imposed by the growth is crucial to, to generate structures with uh, structural fluidity, elements dependency, and evolutive balance. Uh, the future goals uh, for this uh, research is to continue reaching the drawing tool with other geometrical qualities. Uh, the, the, the exploration of the design tools through a, through a 3D platform and the development of a fabrication process associated to it. So that's all, thank you. And I apologize for my nervous. <laughs> From Lisbon University Institute, Ricardo Mendes Correa, Alexandra Paio, and Philip Brandão. And the speaker will be Ricardo Correa, who will speak to us about trans transdisciplinarity, digital change. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, my name is Ricardo Mendes Correa, and I'm here to to talk about transdisciplinarity. Uh, the title of this a paper is Transdisciplinary Digital Change, Science and Architecture. It's about my PhD thesis. Transdisciplinarity is a rather young concept, almost as young as the digital concept with less than 50 years. It was used for, by, for the first time in 1970, less than 50 years ago, 48. Uh, by Jean Piaget at an OECD Congress, uh, and also by Eric Jantz and uh, André Lichnerowitz. Uh, Piaget completed the presentation a year earlier and asked the others to talk about this all new concept of transdisciplinarity. Transdisciplinarity in architecture. Uh, some of the architects who did research in transdisciplinarity, the first one is a bit well known <laughs> by the Barcelona work. Uh, and uh, this all, all of these are architects that work and research in, in transdisciplinarity. This research proposal outlines a historic perspective of transdisciplinary digital architecture through the work of key personalities, establishing links between them. There are certain key personalities that uh, I have considered for this study. The, the main uh, proposal is not to make 13 uh, monographic studies about them, but to trace the links between them to, to help us to 
to tell this story about transdisciplinarity or this part of the story of transdisciplinarity in architecture. Uh, this is what they have done. This is the links of each one of, of them uh, divided in the decades they work and also they are linked to the universities in space in a geographical map uh, where it, they have taught. These are the relationships between them. Well, each one of these uh, arcs represents uh, a relation of being the teacher of, being the student of, being the supervisor of, the advisee. In this particular paper, I'm going to talk about uh, only uh, of three of these uh, key figures. The first one, Stephen Coons. The second one, Ivan Sutherland. And the third one, Nicolas Negroponte. Only the last one is an architect. The first key figure, Stephen Coons. Coons is the isn't one of the most well-known figures in architectural design. He wasn't even an architect, he was a design teacher for a mechanical engineer at MIT. He's one of the most influential scholars in the development of digital architectural design as we know it nowadays. Kunz had important contributions to the introduction of technology culture in architectural design. Some authors in academic research even considered Kunz an essential element to the development of CAD and to computer graphics that are used today in the 21st century. Just a moment to pick some water, I'm sorry. He's well known as the, the guy who invented the Kunz patches, which is a mathematical formulation a technique for representing and manipulate any 3D surfaces in a computer. Original, originally, uh, they were defined in a non-parametrical way and later were based on polynomials. Each patch was therefore defined by four boundaries, as you can see them, and their intersections, and could be manipulated to describe any surface inside. This is the basis of almost all the 3D representation that we use today. This had sound, okay. <laughs> Nowadays, digital architecture can be tracked back. Is, this is the original movie about uh, Sketchpad, a man machine graphical interface, was a PhD th thesis of Ivan Sutherland in 1963. This is important to architecture because this was the first interactive CAD system. With CAD, uh, started a new disciplinary territory that changed design practices. It's not me that I'm saying this, it's my co-supervisor, so... Uh, Project CAD. The name Computer Aided with a Knife Design was coined to a MIT project that lasted from 1959 to 1967. If Sutherland inventiveness must be highlighted, Sketchpad had a background and used the knowledge of MIT's project head, which meant computer assisted, uh, sorry, there's a, a bug here, a computer aided design, of course. The project was based on Kuhn's ideas of a design system to be used by architects and other creative designers without the knowledge to write computer code. Because until then, you only could draw in a computer with uh, machine code. Yes, it was a generative process, some sort of. That idea of an interactive design system was given by Kuhns, who with this simple vision helped to change the way architects design. The project CAD's main objective was to produce a design machine. 
also considered the investigation of techniques of representation and manipulation of design information. It was a, a project uh, that included the development of communications between the human and the computer, because until then, when you wanted a computer to, to make a draw, you have to, to make it in code. You have to pass the code to a, punch, uh, to a punched card and, or a punched tape and then to the computer. This project ad was also the responsible for creating the scientific basis for a series of digital innovations, such as interactive graphical communication, 3D computational graphics, and object-oriented programming. All of these, you can hear well because this is live TV in 1951. This was the first computer with graphical display. It was called Whirlwind and was funded by military funds and done with research at MIT. This is the beginning of a, a computer who could show a picture. Then in sorry, I I didn't know if the sound was going to to come up. So uh, this language was called APT, was automatically programming tools, and was done to work on that computer that we saw before, not the computer but the screen, and they could draw through punched cards make these draws uh, the, the ones low and also can make they could make with that computer a kind of a, a cam doing to control that miling machine that's over there so i've talked about project cad project cad had two directors two different visions one interactive that man over on the right that's stephen coombs and this this other man that wanted an automated design with punched cards. Kunz wanted to use a light pen because there was no mouse. Engelbart hasn't invented yet in 1960. This is how it worked, a non-interactive design. Okay, so a typewriter had to put put the code on that computer, then a person had to see it, then plotted. It was an awful project. This is Stephen Coombs. Sorry, uh, this was a movie done for national television in 1964, so all the people could know that it was possible to draw in a computer. But Kunz went further in spreading the word to creative designers. At a regional conference for our teachers and researchers in 1966, in the peak of the civil rights movement, he dared to say that in a creative process, the man had the perfect slave, and he was referring to the computer. The idea was that the computer, make, uh, the computer to make all the repetitive work, and the, while the designer could have more time to the creative work. Beside patches and CAD, Kunz would be vital for a series of technical developments in PhD thesis related to B splines, to NURBS, rendering 3D animation. 
Kunz foresaw an interactive medium of architects using a computer to establish a dialogue through computer design. With this idea of reconfiguration of design, he cast a pioneer digital architect, Nicolas Negroponte, as his success successor as CAD teacher at MIT. Okay, Kevin Lynch, all the people know, the other two less known. Nicolas Negroponte, although being an architect, is mainly considered as one of the people who invented the computer as an inter interactive media. And he transformed a computer into a cultural machine, which is today. But also, he had an important part as architectural design researcher and teacher. He was chosen by Coons as his replacement as CAD teacher in mechanical engineer, 1967, and in 1968, he was teaching CAD to architects. The significance of the intellectual and professional relationship between Kuhn's and Negroponte has important consequences for architecture. At MIT, he establishes the Architecture Machine Group in 1968, and in 1970, he publishes the book with the same name, Architectural Machine, which completely transforms the ideas of architecture out of the boundaries of pure beaux arts architecture. This is some of the Negroponte projects. Uh, I don't have videos of those. This is Urban Five, uh, early CAD in 1968, uh, completely interactive with a board of buttons. And this is uh, the most extraordinary project because this is a mix of CAD and, uh, and artificial intelligence with the mechanical arm and block words and gerbils. And the mechanical arm changed the place of the, the, the block world to the gerbils as an environment, as a changeable environment. This was in 1970. This was Negroponte ex explaining his early project of architecture in a 2014 TED talk. But the idea of linking architecture, art, and computer science continued with Negroponte to the MIT Media Lab that he founded and envisioned almost like an interactive digital version of Bauhaus. The link of Baus, it, it isn't Kuhn's heritage, but from the visual artist uh, Yari Kerpesh that worked at New Baus with Laszlo Molinas. Kuhn's give Necroponte the chance to rock a figure design as a teacher and not only as a researcher. Soon after Necroponte's master being concluded, Kuhn's chooses him as a CAD teacher, an architect. <coughs> Okay, Kunz went off, Negroponte went on. The CAD uh, came from an uh, engineering uh, environment to an architectural environment. 
this, is what, uh, this was in 1968. Okay, I'm just running out of time. This research uh, aims to trace the evolution of architecture from BAUS to Sketchpad and there to nowadays transdisciplinary digital architecture, focusing on the relationship inter in the interaction between people, places, and institutions, building an interactive platform to present a new vision of transdisciplinary digital architecture through the work of key personalities. This is some topics about my methodology. I'm running out of time, so I'm going past it. This is just an example of a short kind of methodology to uh, research the links between all those people. Uh, the second stage is a database uh, with uh, universities where all these people, uh, all these key personalities teach, taught, sorry, a second stage of database where the the place the names of him and the periods they they taught and we can animate this in uh, space and in time it's a bit speedy but the years are on the top as you can could could see most of these people taught in the same places at the same time they interact together Discussion and preliminary findings. Uh, the scientists Kuhns and Sutherland reconfigured the architectural design through Sketchpad, the first interactive CAD. Kuhns managed to pass those ideas to Negroponte, a teacher of architectural design. So we've got key figures. Kuhns had the computer-aided design concept. Sutherland used that concept to make the first interactive computer-aided design software, and then computer-aided design concept in architecture with Negroponte. The other key figures that I am studying at my PhD thesis, they relate this way. There was a first generation that worked at Bauhaus that communicated to a second generation that communicate to a third generation uh, uh, that includes also Christopher Alexander, William Mitchell, uh, Lionel March, and uh, Charles Eastman, with the, which is the third generation and the first generation of digital architects. These are the references. Obrigado. I don't know. Does anyone want to speak? That mechanism already implemented in sort all GI. All of these uh, uh, weights and parameters and alpha channels already in the module there. <laughs> um, <coughs> most of them are, uh, not all. Um, from the ones I, I presented, the only one that is not present is the um, uh, colors in RGB space using weights. That I kind of used as an intermediary to get from the one dimensional to the three dimensional. Uh, all the others are. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Does anyone else want to do? Some years ago, we began uh, just with the parametric design. Is that in the 90s? <laughs> um, well, we have many discussions about uh, parametric design, not, uh, well, there, there are many senses about uh, parametricism, but I'm talking about the parametric design as a poetic, like Zadid and, uh, and company. Sorry. Well, this discussion is, uh, I would say, um, question is why? <laughs> uh, in a, there is a, I think there is a consequence of uh, the last, uh, uh, what you said, Ricardo, in the last uh, uh, 
speech you said that uh, uh, CAD was a, a very unprofound uh, uh, change in uh, architectural practice. Well, in the, what I said in the beginning is that uh, it was not. It was in the drawing, uh, <coughs> in the drawing practice, and not in architect practice. Well, of course, architect has to draw. Not him, but uh, I say the complete staff of the architectural <coughs> office. But that uh, is not the architectural uh, place. The architect. Is not, uh, the, the architectural place is not in the drawing. And the uh, CAD really didn't uh, bring any uh, development in uh, architectural practice in, his, uh, uh, in its uh, real meaning. <coughs> uh, the narrowness that CAD introduces uh, evolved in, a crea in the creation of uh, uh, a sort of uh, capa capacity of production of uh, drawings that have, I would say, no denotation of semantics. Well, it's uh, very good in uh, syntax because it's formal, it's formal, good in connotational semantics because it has a uh, a very developed uh, uh, geometrical semantics can create uh, shapes, but uh, those shapes has no correspondence to the reality. And to the reality is human life, social life, uh, and nature. <coughs> you must, uh, uh, well, those, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. I'm uh, a, a structural engineer uh, at first. Uh, I still <laughs> have classes of structural engineering in uh, our school. I say my peoples that uh, straight lines and uh, surfaces uh, uh, that are, uh, well, they are straight, they are those are not the, the rationality as some, uh, some people say. Structure gives always optimized uh, forms, shapes, is always curved and complex curves. But they have those curves if they are optimized because they have in their shapes something more than the three dimensions of uh, geographical space. They have other dimensions, for example, movement and energy. If you only work in 3D spaces and geographical spaces, and it's what CAD makes and the parametric CAD makes, it has no correspondence to, to reality. You must input there other variables. <coughs> so I ask why those parametric forms, uh, you said uh, bio biomorphic forms. Well, uh, there is a famous sentence from uh, Ms. van der Rohe that said he's a, he was a very organic architect. Only the, he didn't make uh, uh, buildings with the, the form of organs. <coughs> Well, this is the, the question I would like to, to, to ask you. Why, why those forms, what they bring to, to people? I have to say something on behalf of my supervisor, which is Daniel Cardoso Lias, which is, uh, he made that statement, not me, uh, about uh, architectural design being changed by CAD. And by that 60s CAD, not uh, 80s AutoCAD, because it was, uh, it was happened in the 60s, but was a much developed CAD than the, the 80s AutoCAD. Some of those guys called the 80s AutoCAD uh, dirty dots. 
because it wasn't so developed as that. There's a paper of uh, William Mitchell about it. I think it's called the Rollover Euclid that talks about it. And it's, it is not my citation. It is a citation, not my words, but I agree with all that he said because that way of seeking architecture was completely different from nowadays. And in the 60s, they were using already parametric design. They were uh, already using oriented object programming, and they were already using topology. AutoCAD had have not topology to nowadays. So it's that difference. Uh, can I pass to the morphology or something that you want to explain? Uh, I could have something. Okay. Um, well, uh, I think the main advantage uh, these tools uh, can provide with uh, the architects is uh, mainly heuristics because uh, it's very uh, hard to define uh, architectural problems uh, like engineering because uh, there are many factors involved and uh, even the idea of knowledge uh, I think is very problematic to define. So uh, I think the way these systems could be beneficial is to use uh, both uh, digital simulations and, uh, and the other one is I think physical models uh, especially uh, for that reason and that's why we focused on like uh, always switching between the digital and the physical therefore we could evaluate uh, these uh, shapes uh, for different circumstances and well, that's my please so in my case, I'm using this kind of tools just for one reason. Because biology uh, is a natural thing that, that uh, everything knows, but is, is a phenomenon that uses this kind of tools. And, and if, he, if I want to, to uh, achieve uh, if I want to achieve ecological goals in my in my architecture, I need to use the same process that uh, that n that nature uses. It. So, so it's my point of view for the use of this kind of uh, of drawing tools. Thank you. <laughs> but, but nature, nature has a proposal. They use, for example, uh, the golden uh, ratio. Because yeah, that is. not because uh, there is a reason, because there is a development that is numerically uses the <coughs> uses the golden ratio. Because other processes that don't have that development, they don't use it. So you must use the golden ratio only when you have that kind of development. Yes, that is right, but why use that? Golden ratio in every situation. No, it's not in every situation. It's 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 it, it, it's if I want to reproduce the qualities of the biological structures, I, I, I need to use the 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 values that uh, that she use. No, it, it's, it's so simple like that. So you can point in, in, in a different thing. Uh, there are two kinds of uh, of geometry in in uh, in biological structures. Uh, so you have one kind of of geometry that is the 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 identity. No? Uh, everything that you know have this kind of uh, geometrical pattern. No. So so you have another second, um, and you have another second. Uh, Phase on the geometry that it's imposed by a cognitive entity that no one knows. Uh, so and this uh, and this and uh, this um, entity uh, works with all the elements of 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 of, of the nature and uh, and uh, makes some function uh, and make everything work uh, as a as a wall. So. In my point, I'm just uh, I, uh, I'm just working with the first phase of the geometry because it's 
it's it's a geometry that it's uh, that uh, is all um, it's present in all the uh, in all the objects that uh, we know. Um, but the other stage, I cannot develop. I cannot develop anything because no one knows there's this this cognitive entity. You know? So so you need a, a lots a lot of research in this in this field. I don't know if I answer to you, but I I think no for your face. <laughs> Sorry. Well, thank you very much. So I think we have time for one last question. If anyone. If Wants to ask anything, no one please, David. I have a question for the last uh, Ricardo. Um, uh, if you could explain a bit better the goal of the research. I, I understand the importance of the um, relations that you are trying to establish. In a way, I think they are a bit um, obvious because we we, we connect to each other in, in, the, in common spaces and it's natural that, that we uh, share experience and, and that kind of uh, yeah. things that you explain happen. Mm -hmm. But in, in the end of the, uh, uh, at the end of the research, wh what is your goal? To, to put that figures in a, their right uh, uh, um, recognition, to, to, to bring their work uh, again as a, a very important work, uh, that, 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 that final stage of your research, I didn't understand quite well. What, what you are trying to prove with those kind of relations that you are seeking between these figures that obviously have this kind of range between them, but okay, they have, and we all have here, if you want. After yeah. this, we all go back to our context, and then we can say that one day, during three days, we have this relation. So what's, what's the point in this? Uh, the point is to, there are many studies about uh, historical perspectives of uh, digital architecture, but not as, as much to, focusing, to focus on the transdisciplinary digital architecture. Also, uh, the way that the use uh, of science changed the, the architecture. And, uh, and give the, the tools to, to work with computer science, with computation, not only with uh, the computer, and as uh, frankly uh, as told about the using the computer, uh, just using for, uh, uh, as a drafting tool, but not just as that, but as the way computation changed the architecture. And that is the, uh, trying to explain in a, a historical perspective how how it was changing from the first using the, mach the machine at Bauhaus in teaching in an industrial way that wasn't used in design and architecture, and then to, to the, the new Bauhaus where they used light to, to, and came to the, the animation through light because they hadn't, in the 40s they hadn't the tools that we have today to, to deal with movement. And then it came to a, a new perspective that came with the, the, the 60s with the, the old digital change. First, it was a, a non-interactive digital change like the case of Christopher Alexander who had to program because he was a mathematician and he had to, to program the computers, but to make architecture, to make uh, urban planning, and then to relate that with the, the persons that use interactive uh, architecture, interactive digital architecture, interactive digital architectural drawing. It's like, I want to, to make this connection. And I, I think that all this connection wasn't made before. But yeah, perhaps uh, if anybody can tell me some ways to, to do other way, but I think that, that I can establish the link through here. Uh, I've uh, answered no. <laughs> A bit. Okay. Yes, uh, one last question. Um, if you consider, well, what you presented today works with uh, numeric values. It's very straightforward in the sense that uh, it's uh, mathematical. Uh, it's a almost binary operation if it's black and white, uh, a part of there. The only semantics comes when uh, you decide to 
should I subtract it <coughs> or not in a mathematical form or, or uh, well, or use the, the, the same operations in a different way. Do you think that that, that structure that you present here today, which is plainly numerical, can be used to convey semantic information, for instance, during the development, if uh, some layer has a, a semantic value that over another uh, a rule of the application of a rule may be combined with another one and given a, a specific meaning. Do you think this is uh, feasible? Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, I would say yes. Um, I think the, the reason why, I mean, it's a easier doing it with numbers because um, taking away the semantics gives it a broader applicability. So in a way, the point is um, I, by um, envisioning these particular uses numerically, I'm not imposing um, a particular viewpoint. I'm just saying, look, this is a way you can deal with it. If you want to use it, use it. As soon as you step into the semantics, it becomes obviously much more um, specific. And um, I think it's, it's probably much more valuable. The only question then is, okay, why do you do it this way and why not that way? So for example, I think the um, enumerative colors kind of take a step in that direction in that the way um, Terry Knight uses it, for example, she talks about uh, two materials, um, aluminum and wood, and then um, she specifies in the table what happens when these two materials come together. Now, of course, if whether it is realistic or logical is a different thing, it's, a, it's an interpretation, but it, it, it I think it does add some semantics to, to it. Um, but it is limited, of course, because it's just about, you know, you have two elements with some meaning, you put them together, and then you say, well, you know, this happens, that happens. Um, I think it would be very um, powerful and very valuable to dive more into this and see how, you know, um, other approaches can be embedded into this that are much more meaningful, but I think it would have to come from specific um, case studies or specific um, goals or purposes so that um, it doesn't really matter that um, it, you know, it works for you and it might not work for somebody else. Um, it is as valuable, um, even if it can be, cannot be generalized, but it is, yeah, it's, it's, it's from my point of view, let's say, where I'm looking more at the, at the, um, the overall um, ability rather than particular um, use cases, it, it makes it more difficult. So very well, so I think we can uh, finish this session. I thank you all very much for your presence here. Thank you very much, we're gonna do a short break. Uh,